Okay, in chapter 27, we will be covering the reproductive system, male and female. So the primary sex organs are called gonads. They're testes in males and ovaries in females. The primary cells are the gametes. Those are sex cells. And this, as far as the hormones for males, it's androgens. And uh, for females, it's estrogen and progesterone. So first we'll go through the male reproductive system and then we'll go through the female. The scrotum is the sac of skin that holds the testy. It also um, hangs the testicle lower to lower the, the temperature, lower than the, your body's temperature. And this is ideal for sperm production. Inside the testes, you have these interstitial cells. Sometimes they're called Leydig cells. These are the ones that produce the androgens. So we had talked about in the endocrine chapter that when luteinizing hormone binds to these cells, it produces testosterone. And then we have inside the testes, those little squiggly yellow things on the picture. And those are seminiferous tubules, and those are what produce sperm. And then we've got some other functions, and we'll talk about the epididymis as well. So you see the little squiggly things. Those are the seminiferous tubules where sperm is produced. If you look at the epididymis, that's where we're going to mature sperm. We'll get to that on a different slide. Circumcision is the removal of what's called the foreskin, which is the skin that covers the gland's penis, which is the head of the penis. There's two types of erectile tissue in the male penis. You have two cylindrical bodies called corpora cavernosa and a single cylindrical body surrounding the urethra called the corpus spongiosum. I'll talk about the function here in just a second. This picture just gives us a good visualization uh, of the structures as well as a, if you look at the bottom picture B there, a cross section. So you can see the two cylindrical bodies of the corpora cavernosa and then this corpus spongiosum surrounding the urethra. Okay, you may recall from Anatomy and Physiology 1 that there is an instance where the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system work together and it's in the sexual response. And so the parasympathetic nervous system is responsible for the erection. So the filling, those, those erectile tissues filling with blood. And what happens is it, it causes a release of nitric oxide. Nitric oxide being a vasodilator opens up those blood vessels. And then you have blood flood into the corpora cavernosa, which causes the erection. And what it does is it, um, it compresses drainage veins so that it stays engorged. Now the corpus spongiosum is the body around the urethra, and that's also erectile tissue that fills with blood. What that does, it acts like a splint so that the urethra does not collapse. The job of the sympathetic nervous system is to cause the ejaculation. So the propulsion of semen from the male uh, reproductive ducts. And you can see some detail here. You don't have to know all this detail uh, on the sympathetic spinal reflexes all those details, those bullet points I have on this slide, but do know that when the sympathetic nervous system becomes active during this process, ejaculation occurs. And also remember, the sympathetic nervous system always shuts down the parasympathetic nervous system. So then it causes that blockage of the parasympathetic, causing the decrease in nitric oxide, causing the, um, you know, the, the loss of the erection. The epididymis. This uh, epi means upon, didymis means twin. So this is the little guy that sits upon the twins and has uh, several functions. Primary function being uh, sperm maturation. This is where the sperm actually acquire their ability to move, their motility, and their ability to fertilize. Also, uh, the epididymis will, will provide some fluid, um, or actually, sorry, will absorb some fluid, and um, it will pass nutrients to the actual sperm itself. The ductus deferens, also known as the vas deferens, is simply the tube that takes the sperm from the epididymis to the what's called the ejaculatory duct, which we'll, we'll talk about, or we'll see on a picture, uh, and we'll talk about it in, a, in the lab portion. A vasectomy is the actual ligating or cutting of this, this tube, and it's a nearly 100% effective form of birth control. We've mentioned in the urinary chapter that the male urethra has three parts, the prostatic urethra, which is what goes through the prostate, the membranous urethra goes through the urogenital diaphragm, and then the spongy urethra goes through the corpus spongiosum. Now you have a number of accessory glands for the male reproductive system, one of them being, uh, well it's a pair, the seminal vesicles. They're going to produce an alkaline fluid. This is going to be important. Uh, that alkaline fluid is going to be important to protect the sperm because the female uh, vagina and vaginal uh, canal are acidic, as well as the, the male urethra because it shares, you know, there's urine in there because the, the urinary and reproductive share the same tube, the same urethra. 
Uh, also in the seminal vesicles, they're going to produce uh, fructose, ascorbic acid, uh, some enzymes, as well as prostaglandins. We'll talk a little bit more about this when we, when we sum up all the stuff that's in semen. But about 70% of the volume of semen is, uh, comes from the seminal vesicles. The prostate is another accessory gland that's going to, going to secrete some fluid that it's actually slightly acidic fluid. It's going to contain citrate, enzymes, and then this thing called PSA, prostate-specific antigen, which is used to check for prostate disorders. If that number is off, then it can indicate a, prob a possible problem with the prostate. Uh, the, the, this fluid plays some kind of role in activation of sperm. Uh, it's not quite clear, but it does play a role in activation of sperm as well. The bulbourethral gland, also known as the Cowper's gland, this one is going to secrete uh, an alkaline mucus. And so I don't know if I have it on this slide here, but uh, which is, it produces a, a, a thick, clear mucus. Go ahead and write alkaline in there. It's going to neutralize the acid urine that's in the urethra. As I mentioned, there'll be some remnants of urine in there. And urine's pH is between 4.5 and 8. It averages around 6. So it is, it is uh, an acidic substance that could damage the sperm. So this is going to help you know, neutralize that acid. All right, so what have we made so far? Well, you've got sperm that comes from the seminiferous tubules and some testicular fluid in there. You have some of it got absorbed by the, the epididymis. But then you've got a, a bunch of other stuff that just these accessory organs produce, right? So you're going to have nutrients in there like fructose. You're going to have some protection for, we talked about the alkaline fluid. Um, also activation of the sperm. We talked about the prostatic fluid. And then we talked about some prostaglandins that are going to help. Uh, and so there, there's some that help facilitate movement. There's one called relaxin. And that, that gets actually produced by the prostate. And then um, there's prostag other prostaglandins produced by the seminal vesicles. And what those will do is actually will actually decrease the viscosity of the mucus in the female cervix. And uh, viscosity is like a thickness or stickiness, right? So it's, it's making it easier to move through. And it's also going to stimulate the uterus of the female to uh, have reverse peristalsis or undergo reverse peristalsis, which will help propel the sperm towards the uterine tubes where fertilization may occur. Now, we said the alkalinity is really important for neutralizing the acid of both the male urethra and the female vagina, protecting the sperm. Uh, some other chemicals that are in there, we have antibiotic uh, chemicals, one called seminal plasmin that helps destroy bacteria. Now, this is not going to fight like STDs and things like that, but it's designed to protect the actual sperm themselves. Some other things we want to know, and, and I want you to know these numbers because they're important. About two to five milliliters of semen get ejaculated, and each milliliter has about 20 to 150 million sperm. So that's a range of about 40 to 750 million sperm. Now, Infertility is when the sperm count falls below 20 million per milliliter. So this is, this is a, a large number, so it obviously takes a lot for fertilization, to, a lot of sperm for fertilization to occur. Now, infertility and impotence are two completely different things. Impotence is the inability to sustain an erection. These things are, uh, they don't have anything to do with each other. They may both be occurring, but for different reasons, or it might just be one thing occurring, but again, they're not related to each other. Benign prostatic hyperplasia, sometimes it's called benign prostatic hy hypertrophy, but it's more accurate to say hyperplasia because uh, of increased number of cells rather than increased size of cells. But this is, is a hypertrophy, an enlargement of the prostate. It can cause difficulty urinating because remember the, the prostatic urethra runs through the prostate so it can compress the urethra. Uh, it can increase the risk of bladder infections, which is uh, cystitis we've talked about in uh, previous chapters. And uh, there's a natural treatment for it. Uh, it does not necessarily shrink the size of the prostate, but it does alleviate the symptoms. It's called saw palmetto. It's an herb. They've actually done two studies, one of which was in the American Journal, or the Journal of American Medical Association, where they compared it to ProScar, which is a drug that's used to treat uh, BPH. Uh, but the drug actually has side effects of loss of libido, where saw palmetto does not cause that side effect. And the effective dose that's used for soft palmetto is 160 milligrams twice a day. So in addition to BPH, there could be something called prostatitis, which is inflammation of the prostate. It could be caused by an infection or some type of trauma. Uh, prostatic cancer, it's the second most common cause of cancer death in men. Now we said that colon cancer or colorectal is the second most common cause of cancer death in both men and women together. But if it's just men alone, then prostate cancer is the number two killer. Okay. Um, PSA we mentioned before, that is used to screen for, now it's not specific. I mean, it's, it's called prostate specific antigen, but it's not specific as to what the problem is. It just says that there's some type of issue going on with the prostate. Could be cancer, could be BPH, infection, 
So um, it's, it's unclear. You do not need to know the numbers on this. Spermatogenesis is going to be all the events that take place to go from a stem cell called the spermatogonium to a spermatozoa, which is the sperm. It takes about 65 to 70 days for this process to happen, but you're making about 300 million sperm per day with spermatogenesis. Now, it's going to be a haploid number of chromosomes. That means most, cell, most body cells are diploid, which they contain pairs. This is going to be a, a single set of chromosomes, which makes sense because in the, in the oocyte, you're gonna have the same, and then when you combine the one, pair, one set with the other set of 23 uh, uh, chromosomes, then you get your pair, then you get your diploid number again. All right, so on this slide, I'm going to go through the four processes involved in spermatogenesis. And you have slides that follow this that you can go and look at. I don't have them in this presentation, but uh, you can go ahead and look at the explanations of each of these processes. So the first, we're starting with this diploid cell called a spermatogonium. This is the stem cell for the sperm cells. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna put that spermatogonium through mitosis. Now mitosis, we split into two identical daughter cells preserving the chromosome number, right? The daughter cells are identical to that parent cell. And so we have two diploid cells at that point at the end of mitosis. Now we're gonna follow one of them down the rest of the path. The next step that happens, uh, and by the way, this, this, this daughter cell is now called a primary spermatocyte. We're gonna take that primary spermatocyte and put it through meiosis one. And in meiosis one, it's going to split into two secondary spermatocytes, each one having a haploid number of chromosomes. So here's where we're splitting the genetic code. <clears throat> then we're gonna take, oh, and those secondary spermatocytes, we're gonna take those and put them through meiosis two. When we do that, they split into four. So those two split into four, and we end up with four spermatids at the end of meiosis two. We do not split the, the, the genetic number here, or the genetic code here, right? So we, we still have a haploid number for all of the spermatids. And then we go through the last step, where we're going to form the tail, um, the flagella tail, we're gonna slough off some of the cytoplasm, and that last process is called spermiogenesis, and that's going from spermatid to spermatozoa, which is essentially sperm. Now the sperm can survive about 48 hours in the female reproductive tract once it is ejaculate, they are ejaculated. Um, and a couple of components of the sperm, you've got the head of the sperm that contains, has a bag of enzymes on it called the acrosome, and those enzymes are what are designed to kind of eat away and penetrate at the egg. Uh, the midpiece is uh, where the mitochondria are for the energy, and then the tail has the flagella, which is for locomotion. This just gives you the visual of the sperm with the head, midpiece, and tail, as well as the acrosome on the head of the sperm. Now you have these cells called sustentacular cells, also known as Sertoli cells, and they're going to do a number of things. They're going to provide nutrients and signals to the dividing cells. They're going to, in that last process called spermiogenesis, they're going to help slough off the cytoplasm. And then they're also going to secrete some testicular fluid to help transport the sperm as well. Now you're going to have a blood testes barrier. This is to prevent the sperm from getting into the bloodstream because the sperm antigens are going to be foreign, right? Because they weren't around. These, these show up at puberty when the thymus has already done a lot of education of the T cells and the, the bone marrow, the B cells. And so you're, these, these antigens would be recognized as foreign if they were to get into the bloodstream. All right, so let's go through the hormones uh, and how they function in the male reproductive system. And a little bit of this will be a review from the endocrine chapter. We start off with the hypothalamus releases a hormone called gonadotropin releasing hormone. That hormone causes a release of gonadotropins from the anterior pituitary. Well, what are the gonadotropins? You have FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, and LH, luteinizing hormone. Now, what does follicle stimulating hormone do? Well, essentially it's going to enhance spermatogenesis. But the detail process I have explained here on this slide, it's gonna release, <clears throat> well, the sustentacular cells are gonna release this protein called antigen binding protein. It's gonna make spermatogenic cells receptive to testosterone, which is the final trigger for spermatogenesis. And that's going to cause the formation of sperm. And so the FSH is intimately involved in, you know, causing that spermatogenesis, that sperm formation. Luteinizing hormone, we learned in the endocrine chapter, it, it binds to the interstitial cells and it's gonna cause the interstitial cells to release testosterone. 
As I mentioned on the previous slide, testosterone is the final trigger for spermatogenesis. And um, how do, what, what do we, how do we uh, get a feedback from these or, or a shutoff mechanism from these? Well, it's a negative feedback system for males and it's very, it's very direct and linear. So when the gonadotropin releasing hormone causes the luteinizing hormone to be released, it's going to cause testosterone to be produced. Testosterone is going to build up when we have enough testosterone. The testosterone will cause negative feedback that will shut off the hypothalamus from producing gonadotropin releasing hormone and it will shut off the anterior pituitary from produce, producing luteinizing hormone. The negative feedback for FSH is a little bit different, just an additional step here. What happens is um, we have the gonadotropin releasing hormone causing the release of FSH. FSH triggers that spermatogenesis. When you have enough sperm, the sustentacular cells, which we said are also called Sertoli cells, they are going to produce a hormone called inhibin. Inhibin will then go ahead and shut off the hypothalamus from producing gonadotropin releasing hormone, and it will shut off the anterior pituitary from producing follicle stimulating hormone. And so both of these serve as a negative feedback mechanism when you know balance has been reached, when you have enough testosterone and you have enough sperm formed. Now we know testosterone is anabolic, additional effects. Uh, we know it gets synthesized also from cholesterol because it's a steroid-based hormone. And it can get transformed to certain target tissues. In the prostate, it gets transformed to dihydrotestosterone, which is DHT. And it can be converted to estrogen as well. And by the way, there's, there's an enzyme called 5-alpha reductase that will convert it to dihydrotestosterone. Uh, if we take an enzyme called aromatase, it can convert it to estrogen. And for men, they do need a small amount of estrogen. It's necessary for neurons in the brain to bring about some stimulatory effects. So our testosterone is promoting spermatogenesis, as we saw, because it's that final trigger. It's going to, um, it, it's anabolic, right? So then under number three, it increases protein synthesis. It also supports all of the reproductive organs. And it's, you know, as far as the male reproductive organs. And it is the, it is the sex drive for males as well. So libido is controlled by testosterone for males. For females, um, it's believed it's DHEA, but now they're looking and saying, well, you know, they used to think it was testosterone, then DHEA, now they're saying it's probably a combination of both. DHEA is uh, dehydroepiandosterone, and that is another anabolic hormone uh, that is, or an androgen, <clears throat> that is produced uh, in both males and females. For your secondary sex characteristics in males, I'll let you read those, but it's the common things that you would see with puberty, and you can go ahead and memorize this slide. All right, so now we'll go through the female reproductive system. And this one is a good view <clears throat> that shows the uterus and then some of the ligaments associated. We can also see the ovary, and inside the ovary, we've got the ovarian follicles, as well as the remnant of the follicle that developed into something called the corpus luteum, and we'll be talking about all these structures. Now the follicle is going to develop in five stages. It starts off with a primordial follicle, which becomes a primary follicle, then a secondary, a late secondary, then your most mature follicle, which is a graphene follicle. It's also known as a vesicular or tertiary follicle. Oftentimes I just call it graphene follicle. That's the most mature stage of the follicle. And that's right before ovulation. And then we'll talk about that. So the ovulation occurs <clears throat> somewhere around day 14. And it's going to eject the oocyte with this little, uh, this little coating around it called the corona radiata. And that is ovulation. Well, the remnant of the follicle is then going to develop into the corpus luteum, which will be a structure that will actually produce hormones. Here you can visualize the different stages of follicular development, looking at the graphene follicle, then the expulsion of the oocyte with the corona radiata at ovulation, and also the developing corpus luteum. Now the fimbriae are the little finger-like structures that they, they beat and create a current to suck the oocyte into the uterine tube. And the uterine tube is uh, usually, well this is where the oocyte should get fertilized. If it does get fertilized, it's usually uh, right in the ampulla portion of the uterine tube. Let's look at a picture so we can kind of see what this looks like. If you look here, it's a kind of a better picture. You see like one little finger of the fimbriae attached to the ovary. It's not like it looks in a lot of pictures, but it almost looks like the fimbriae are cupping the ovary. That's not how it really is. Because those little fimbriae, again, they need to beat and create a current to suck the oocyte into the uterine tube. And then along with peristalsis and cilia, we move the uterine tube, we move the oocyte down the uterine tube. The three layers of the uterine wall, we've got the perimetrium. Peri means around, so this is 
uh, the outside layer. Then you have the myometrium, myo means muscle. This is the smooth muscle layer. And then you also have the endometrium, which is the inside mucosal lining. Now the endometrium has two sublayers. You have a functional layer and a basal layer. The stratum functionalis is the one that sheds during menstruation. So this responds to hormones and then will shed cyclically, you know, on the monthly cycle. The stratum basalis does not respond to hormones and it's responsible for rebuilding the stratum functionalis after the um, menses portion of the menstrual cycle, as, after the shedding phase of the lining. Now, females have greater vestibular glands, which are also known as Bartholin's glands. These are homologous to the bulbourethral glands. It's just kind of the female version, but they don't secrete alkaline mucus. What their, their job, they do release mucus, but it's specifically for lubrication of the vestibule. The clitoris is erectile tissue, just like the corpus cavernosum and the corpus spongiosum. So it will become erect and it will fill with blood uh, when, under arousal with the parasympathetic nervous system. And uh, the perineum, or perineum, is this diamond-shaped region between the pubic arch and the coccyx. And um, this is the site that gets incised when there's an episiotomy. So it puts an episiotomy. It's, it's an incision that gets made to widen the vaginal orifice during the birthing process, if necessary. So mammary glands are modified sweat glands. And there's, there's lobules within the uh, mammary glands that are going to uh, produce or these lobules containing alveoli that are going to produce the milk and remember the stimulus for that was the prolactin right prolactin causes the production of milk this just gives you a visualization of the breast with the associated structures the lactiferous ducts and sinuses from the front and the side view now I'm not going to hold you responsible for risk factors for uh, breast cancer because we're going to see the majority of breast cancer um, there's no known risk factors uh, but, you know, if there's a family history of breast cancer, things like that, then obviously the individual wants to be more, you know, pay a little more closer, I should say, closer attention. Uh, and in fact, I do want you to know is that 10% are due to hereditary defects. That's the, uh, the genes that they've identified, the BRCA1 and the BRCA2 genes. So 70% of women with breast cancer have no known risk factors, as I said, the majority there. Um, so it's really important to, have self, to do self-examination, um, also mammography when necessary, uh, you know, doctor exams, uh, you know, yearly. And so this is something that's a good screening process. Uh, the treatment for breast cancer is, if it's caught early, is very, very effective. There's a number of different types of treatment, radiation, chemotherapy, and then surgery uh, are, are the types of, you know, therapies or treatments that are used. Again, if it's caught early, it's usually very successful. All right, oogenesis. Uh, this is going to be a lot more complex than the spermatogenesis because we have a number of different facets that we're going to look at. But this is the production of the oocytes, so the, the female gametes. And it starts with a stem cell called an oogonia. It's a, that's a diploid cell. I'm going to go through this on the slides and then we'll look at it on the picture and kind of review it again. And so first you're going to have the uh, oogonia go through mitosis to create the two daughter cells. These are gonna be primary oocytes. Now, you have about uh, 200,000 to 2 million at birth, only about 40,000 remain at puberty, and about 400 of those will mature. Those are the ones that get ovulated on the monthly basis. Now, primary oocytes are going to begin meiosis. This is all happening in the fetal period. They're gonna begin, begin meiosis one, but they're gonna stall in prophase one, okay? And so they're gonna stay there until puberty at, in that phase. Now at puberty, there's gonna be generally one oocyte chosen to be ovulated, and uh, that one is going to resume meiosis one and continue, to, and it's gonna make that split. And this is when we split it, the, the chromosome number. And so you're gonna get, it's gonna be a little different though. We're gonna split into a secondary oocyte and a first polar body, and the polar body is really a non-functional cell. Then the secondary oocyte starts meiosis two. But it's going to stall, and this time it stalls in metaphase, so metaphase two, which is the metaphase of meiosis two, and, um, and then it's gonna get ovulated. Now, if it does not get fertilized, it stays in this phase and then just leaves, it, it exits, right? If it does get fertilized, then it's going to complete meiosis two, finish the split, and now it splits into an ovum and a second polar body, again, the polar body being a non-functional cell. Now, when the sperm, uh, the, the 
chromosomes, right, or the genetics from the sperm combined with the, the oocyte in the ovum, then we're going to call it a zygote. All right, so let's go through this process. We start off with an oogonium. That's a single uh, oogonia, right? and stem cell for the oocyte. Now, if you look on this picture, it's only following the path of one. So remember, that oogonium is gonna split into two primary oocytes. We're just gonna follow the path of one. So we take that one primary oocyte and we start meiosis one, stalling and prophase. Then, at puberty, one of them is going to get ovulated per month and it's going to finish meiosis one, split into a secondary oocyte and a first polar body. It's going to begin meiosis two, but stall in metaphase. And then if it does not get fertilized, it's done, right? It goes out. And if it does get fertilized, you can see the sperm there in the picture. If it does fertilize the secondary oocyte, meiosis two continues and we split into an ovum and a second polar body. And when the genetic material combines the haploid from the sperm and the haploid from the, the, o, the oocyte, it's going to be called a zygote. So the ovarian cycle has three, uh, well, two phases and then that mid portion called ovulation. So it's a 28 day cycle. Now we do know that there are irregularities, but you know, we're talking about creating a structure. It's, it's just this 28 day cycle. Again, there can be vari variances in that 28 day cycle. It could be a longer cycle. Some of the phases can shift a little bit, but the follicular phase is days one through 14. This is when the follicle is growing as we saw in the picture of the developing follicle to the different stages. Mid-cycle, that graphene fo follicle is going to eject the oocyte, that's the ovulation. And then the luteal phase is from that day 14 to 28, that's the period of the corpus luteum activity. And so remember the corpus luteum is the remnant of the follicle that's going, or it's gonna develop from the remnant of the follicle and it's gonna produce hormones. We know that ovulation is when the ovarian wall ruptures and expels the oocyte with that little corona radiata on it, around it. Um, if you feel a twinge of pain at ovulation, it's called middle schmerz. And about 1-2% to of all ovulations result in fraternal twins. And what that is, is more than one secondary oocyte gets ejected and they both get fertilized. Now during that luteal phase, we said the corpus luteum is uh, created and active here. And it's going to secrete hormones, progesterone, estrogen, relaxin, and inhibin. So the corpus luteum will produce those four hormones for about 10 days and then it's going to degenerate unless fertilization occurs. So if, if fertilization occurs, then the corpus luteum is going to actually stick around for about three months to continue to produce hormones until the placenta is able to take over and produce those hormones. Now another hormone to be familiar with is HCG, which is human chorionic gonadotropin. It gets produced around the eighth day by the chorion of the embryo and eventually by the placenta. And uh, this is the indicator for pregnancy when, you, when, when someone's doing a, um, you know, a pregnancy test, this is what it's looking for, the HCG. So again, it starts to be produced about day eight. So really it's not gonna be accurate uh, till probably around, somewhere around two weeks. All right, let's talk about hormones for females and then we're gonna kind of implement them into this hormonal cycle. But uh, some of the stuff we've seen from chapter 16 is we have gonadotropin-releasing hormone that gets released. Now, gonadotropin-releasing hormone is, gonna, is going to cause the release of gonadotropins, follicle-stimulating hormone, and luteinizing hormone that are going to have different effects in females. And we're going to edit the next slide just a little bit. Um, but what we want to know is what does follicle-stimulating hormone do? Well, it's going to stimulate follicular growth. It will also stimulate the follicle to secrete estrogen. All right, so I made a little edit on this slide of the things I want you to focus on. So luteinizing hormone in, is going to do the same two things we saw follicle-stimulating hormone do. It's going to cause development of the follicle, and it's going to cause the follicle to secrete estrogen. That's our first two bullet points. Some additional things you will see luteinizing hormone uh, do is it will cause the completion or stimulate the completion of meiosis one. It's going to trigger ovulation, and it's going to promote the development and formation of the corpus luteum, which we said will produce those four hormones. Estrogen that gets secreted by the follicle is going to cause uh, primary and secondary sex characteristics for females. It's anabolic for females. It's actually going to shuttle calcium into the bones. We'll see that on a later slide as well. It's going to lower uh, total blood cholesterol and actually increase HDLs. We'll see that later as well. Uh, that is the good cholesterol, or the, it's technically a lipoprotein, but known as your good cholesterol. 
And then really important that we'll see in the cycle that estrogen is going to inhibit the release of gonadotropin-releasing hormone and the gonadotropins LH and FSH. Now, progesterone. This is mainly secreted by the corpus luteum. This is going to work with estrogen to prepare um, and main, that should say maintain, it says maintain, <laughs> to maintain the endometrium for implantation. It's also going to prepare the mammary glands for milk, milk production. And then another thing that we'll see with progesterone is that it inhibits gonadotropin-releasing hormone and luteinizing hormone. If we look at inhibin, the key thing here is the inhibition of the gonadotropins, FSH and LH. And then if we look at relaxin, um, that is going to uh, relax the uterus by inhibiting the contraction of the muscle called the myometrium, or that layer called the myometrium. At the end of pregnancy, relaxin is going to increase flexibility of the pubic symphysis and help dilate uh, the cervix. Now, when we're talking about the ovarian cycle, we're going to talk about the hormonal cycle here for females, which um, is going to be a little more complex, again, than just like turning it on and shutting it off. And so what happens is the ovaries secrete a little bit of estrogen, uh, you know, during childhood, and that estrogen is going to inhibit the gonadotropin-releasing hormone, which inhibits the release of gonadotropins. As puberty nears, gonadotropin-releasing hormone does get released, and it causes the release of both FSH and LH, and then this cycle is going to begin. Now, menarche uh, is the first menstrual cycle. So as we start off with the cycle, we start off with the release of gonadotropin-releasing hormone that causes the release of follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone, which are the gonadotropins. Okay? What do they do? Well, we saw before their function. We said that both of them not only cause follicular development, but they cause the follicle to secrete estrogen. So estrogen levels are going to rise. Well, what do we say one of the things estrogen does? Well, it inhibits gonadotropin-releasing hormone and the gonadotropin. So that's what it's going to do. It's going to block them. But what it's also going to do is it's going to cause itself to be produced more. So it's going to cause this positive feedback cycle where as estrogen levels rise, it will cause more estrogen to be produced. Now, this is talking about, the, remember, the vesicular follicle is the graphene follicle, and so this the follicle is what's producing the estrogen here, and as we produce more estrogen, as I said on the last slide, there's going to be a positive feedback cycle, increasing estrogen levels, but at mid-cycle, here's what's going to happen. Now, it was previously suppressing the gonadotropins, but there's this interesting thing that happens that at day 14, it's going to cause this sudden surge in luteinizing hormone, and then we have these additional effects, effects of luteinizing hormone. So that spike in luteinizing hormone is going to cause the completion of meiosis 1, which is of the secondary oocyte, and it's going to trigger ovulation, and it's also going to transform the ruptured follicle into the corpus luteum. So these are, these are some functions that we talked about earlier. Now, we said the corpus luteum is going to produce inhibin, progesterone, estrogen, and relaxin. Right? So I don't have relaxin listed on this slide, but we said those four hormones before, and we talked about the function of those hormones. But remember, these guys, inhibin, progesterone, and estrogen, those three are going to inhibit gonadotropin-releasing hormone as well as the gonadotropins FSH and LH. So what we're saying is, as long as the corpus luteum's around, it's going to inhibit the cycle from starting over again. So a lot of people say, well, can you have a menstrual cycle during pregnancy? Well... If, if you don't have pregnancy, then the corpus luteum degenerates after 10 days, and then you have the cycle, you know, that inhibition of the gonadotropins and the gonadotropin-releasing hormone is removed, right, and it starts over again. But if you have pregnancy, the corpus luteum sticks around for about three months to produce these hormones, so no, you cannot technically have a menstrual cycle, even if you have symptoms uh, and things that seem like you're having a menstrual cycle. Remember, you're not going to produce gonadotropin-releasing hormone and the gonadotropins as long as you have this corpus luteum producing hormones that inhibit that cycle from starting over again. So when the corpus luteum does degenerate, it stops producing those hormones, the blockage of the gonadotropins is, is over, and we start the cycle over again with gonadotropin-releasing hormone causing the release of FSH and LH, and we go back through this cycle again. All right, so the uterine cycle, also known as the menstrual cycle, has three phases. Again, I know in a, in a perfect world, it would be this exact 28-day cycle, which it, it, it isn't always, but we're going to talk about it that way so that we can put some numbers to it. Um, the first five days is the menstrual phase called menses, and this is the shedding of the uterine lining that we, that we talked about, the stratum functionalis. Days 6 through 14 is the proliferative phase, also called preovulatory. This is where the endometrium is rebuilding. We know at day 14 is generally ovulation. 
Days 15 through 28 is the post-ovulatory or secretory phase. This is where the endometrium is rebuilding, is, is not only rebuilding, but preparing for implantation of the embryo if fertilization has occurred. Okay, ectopic pregnancy is the development of the embryo or fetus outside the uterine cavity. So it implants anywhere that's outside the uterine cavity. Uh, oftentimes, this type of pregnancy would be in the uterine tube. Now, smoking, uh, people that smoke are two times more likely to have ectopic pregnancy because nicotine paralyzes the cilia, not only in your lungs, but also in the uterine tube to help move the oocyte along. And so that it actually starts to implant in the tube because it doesn't get out of the tube and implant in the uterine cavity where it's supposed to. Uh, some other risk factors besides smoking are scarring due to PID, public inflammatory disease, uh, any kind of uterine tube surgeries, as well as previous ectopic pregnancies. Uh, by the way, an ectopic a tubal pregnancy um, is the, the fetus cannot survive. So there are ectopic pregnancies that survive, but they're not in the tubes. And so if we look on the next picture, we can kind of see some things that might work. So if it's in the tube, that the child is not growing in the tube. Okay, that's not gonna happen. So if it's a tubal pregnancy, a tubal type of ectopic pregnancy, the child will not survive. Um, if you look at it though, let's say it's interstitial, you can see it's partially in the uterine cavity there or in the cervix, possibly can grow into the uterine uh, cavity. These are possible, they're not likely to survive, but those are possibilities. So we've to recap effects of estrogen, we said it promotes the oogenesis and follicular growth. Uh, we also said that it has anabolic effects in the female. We said that it will facilitate calcium into the bones. That's down at number five there. We said also that it's going to lower total cholesterol and raise the good HDLs, the lipoproteins, known as the good cholesterol. And um, it also causes the growth spurt for females at puberty. And in addition to the initial female uh, primary sex characteristics, estrogen also causes development of secondary sex characteristics, which again, you can read and memorize. A note about female sexual response, we already talked about the greater vestibular glands causing the lubrication of the vestibule. Uh, as far as females, they do not have a refractory period after an orgasm, so they have the ability to have multiple orgasms in a single sexual experience. Now menopause, this is when menses have ceased for a year or more. Now there are things that can cause these temporary menopauses or what we call secondary menopause, uh, like in a female athlete triad, things like that. But but true menopause is when it has ceased for about a year or more. And um, there's a number of things that go along with that. There's basically what's happening at menopause is the estrogen pretty much drops off the cliff of production, right? So the, the ovaries pretty quickly stop producing estrogen. You still make a little bit of estrogen in the adrenal glands, but that drop in estrogen, remember the estrogen is anabolic for females, so there's atrophy of reproductive organs for females when this estrogen drops. Sometimes irritability and depression, hot flashes for some with this extreme vasodilation that happens, uh, gradual thinning of the skin and bone loss. We know that it's protective of the bones, right, because it shuttles the calcium into bones. Also, it's protective of the heart because it, it lowers the cholesterol, estrogen, and raises the HDLs, the good cholesterol. So you'll see a drop uh, in the HDLs. You'll see also an increase in the total cholesterol. So those are some of the effects that you're going to see with menopause. Now, the textbook oftentimes says there's no counterpart in males, but research says differently. There is something known as andropause. It's just more gradual decline in testosterone. That would, uh, that would occur in males. As far as genetics, I want you to know just a couple of key points. Um, there's 23 pairs of chromosomes, um, and the sex chromosomes are the X and the Y. Females have an XX, males have an XY. So males technically determine the sex of the child because they can donate either, so 50% they're going to donate the X, and 50% will be the Y. So females can only donate the X. So again, XX is female and XY is male. All right, the moment we've all been waiting for, right? Sexually transmitted infections, also known as sexually transmitted diseases. Uh, they are the single most uh, significant cause of reproductive disorders. And uh, STDs cannot be prevented by washing the genitals, by urinating, or by douching after sex. Now, urinating, I may have mentioned in the urinary chapter, is really important after uh, sex to prevent urinary tract infections, but that's different than an STD. Now, I covered HIV in the immune system chapter, so we will not be covering that in this chapter, but let's talk about some others. You've got gonorrhea, which is a bacterial infection. This spreads by genital, anal, or pharyngeal contact. 
Ejaculation does not have to occur, and latex condoms are effective when they are used properly in preventing this. I won't have you memorize all the signs and symptoms, but obviously there are certain things like uh, inflammation and painful urination, sometimes pus discharge. But a key thing here, 20% of females display no signs or symptoms, and this is dangerous because it can result in pelvic inflammatory disease, which is actually a main contributor to female sterility. Uh, because this is bacterial, it can be treated with antibiotics. All right, syphilis is also a bacterial infection that can be transmitted vaginal, anal, or oral sex through direct contact with the actual syphilis sore. It can be contract contracted congenitally by the, the fetus, and infected fetuses are usually stillborn or will die shortly after birth. Now, the initial symptoms for syphilis occur after about two to three weeks. So there's a two to three uh, week period uh, that the person is asymptomatic. Then a painless canker appears uh, at the site of the infection and it'll disappear uh, within a few weeks. That does not mean that the infection's gone. Again, this is bacterial, so it needs to be treated with antibiotics. So if it is untreated, uh, several weeks later, uh, the, the secondary signs of syphilis show up, uh, rash, fever, joint pain, things of this nature. That can progress, if still not treated, to tertiary syphilis, which can actually cause lesions in the central nervous system, as well as uh, other uh, parts of the body like blood vessels, bone, and skin. And so, again, as, because it's bacterial, we know we can treat this with an antibiotic, usually penicillin, unless there's a penicillin allergy, then another, uh, another uh, type of treatment or antibiotic would be used. Uh, as far as prevention, this is not one of the ones that's very effective as far as use of a condom unless you directly cover the syphilis sore. Same thing with cancroid, same thing with herpes sores. They have to be directly covered in order for the condom to actually be effective at preventing those particular STIs from spreading. Chlamydia is the most common bacterial STI in the United States and about 25 to 50 percent of all pelvic inflammatory disease is caused by chlamydia. Uh, it can be transmitted vaginal, anal, or oral, and uh, also from mom to baby, but during the birthing process, not in utero. Chlamydia is one of the ones that is preventable if uh, correct condom use is used. And so uh, the only other thing I'm going to mention here with symptoms, you can read your symptoms, but uh, this can be a significant factor in causing um, sterility in females. Uh, the drugs that are used to treat this, because it's, again, bacterial, would be antibiotics and usually tetracycline class drugs. z or Zithromax is a, a common one used to treat this. Genital warts is caused by HPV, human papillomavirus. It's the second most common STI in the United States. Um, there are over 100 different types of HPV, and 40 of those, or approximately 40 of those, are anogenital or affect the anogenital region. Uh, the, so not all of them. So any wart you have, by the way, because this can cause genital warts, but uh, any wart is caused by a type of HPV, just not all the HPVs are genital, right? So uh, if we look down at our bottom bullet point here, genital warts can ca be caused by HPV. Also certain types of cancers can be caused uh, by HPV. And the ones that cause warts do not cause the cancer, and the ones that cause cancers do not cause the warts. In 90% of the cases with HPV, the body's immune system will clear it within about two years. Uh, up to 30% of genital warts can actually go away without treatment, uh, but, but the majority will not. And uh, this is passed through contact uh, with the actual uh, warts. So it can be um, genital contact, uh, it could be vaginal or anal sex, and it could even be passed through uh, oral sex. Now, HPV, uh, occurs, it's, it's fairly common, we said, it's, it, it occurs in at least 50% of sexually active men and women at some point in their lives. There is a vaccine for HPV, it's called Gardasil, I believe they have another one now too, but Gardasil treats for four different types. Uh, there's many different types, as we said, of HPV. You will not have to know the numbers as far as type 6, type 11, 16, and 18, but realize there's four types, and it's basically the two most common types that cause warts, which covers 90% of the, the ones that cause anogenital warts, and uh, the two most common types that cause cancer, which accounts for about 70% of the cervical cancers. Genital herpes, also viral. This is caused by human herpes virus type 2. This, um, I'm not going to hold you responsible for the statistics, but you can go ahead and read through some of those. They're pretty interesting. Uh, some things that I want you to know is that 
Uh, HSV-1 is the oral type of herpes, and HSV-2 is the genital herpes. And they both can exhibit something called viral shedding. So there, there doesn't need to be an actual outbreak on the skin for the virus to shed on the skin, which means it can actually be passed through this viral shedding. And according to the CDC, uh, the viral shedding is most common within those first two years of contracting the virus, but can occur thereafter as well. Now, there is no way to get rid of uh, either type 1 or type 2 uh, herpes virus. It does uh, hide in the body, hides in the neurons, I believe, and uh, so there's no cure for it, uh, regardless of some of the claims that out there. Uh, there's no cure. There are treatments and drugs for it, antiviral drugs. Aciclovar is a common uh, drug that's used to, to inhibit the outbreaks and the spread to one's sexual partner. Okay, that wraps up the reproductive chapter. The um, contraceptives are not going to be on the exam. I have some information in there uh, for you in your PowerPoint slides that you can just review for your own edification and education. And that wraps it up. Stay strong. I'll see you next time.